Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor David Motley. Um, he received his PhD in physics in 2004 at UC Davis um, under the supervision of Professor Rajiv Singh and where he was working or modeling amyloids, which are proteins responsible for prion disease, among other topics. Then he moved to UC San Francisco, where he did a puzzle with Professor Ken Deal and developed a lot of computations on binding free energies and proteins and started his lab as an assistant professor first at the Department of Chemistry uh, at the University of New Orleans in 2008 and then moved to the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences at UC Irvine where he's at now in 2012 and he was promoted to full professor in, in 2018. Now his lab focuses a lot on free energy methods for pharmaceutical and drug discoveries we will probably see today and he has had a, an extremely productive research career, has received more than almost 9,000 citations and, and has an age index of 43, so that says a lot. And today he will be talking about developing and using free energy calculations to guide pharmaceutical lead optimization. So, please. Thanks very much for the nice introduction and I'm looking forward to getting a chance to talk with all of you. Feel free to um, you know, wave at me in the middle with your virtual hand or something if you want me to stop and, and take, take any questions. Um, I'll probably stop, try to remember to stop a couple times as I go. Um, so I'm gonna talk about you know, sort of the big picture of what my lab is trying to work on and then some of the specific things we've been doing in this area. Though there's an, a variety of different things going on and I certainly won't try to cover all of them. So one of our key concerns is um, what you could call pharmaceutical lead optimization, which is part of making and developing new pharmaceuticals. But I'll tell you a little bit about what that means. Um, so one thing that's interesting in this area is that you know drug discovery is hard and expensive. Um, I think you know in the in the popular media, maybe you get an idea that drug just drug companies are just these big money making machines that uh, charge people a ton of money for stuff that ought to be cheap, but that's not really the case. Um, it takes a ton of basic research to bring new drugs to market. So if you look at over time, how the cost of drug, of the research going into drugs um, coming to market has changed. So on the vertical axis here, we have number of drugs per billion US dollars, and that's a fl inflation adjusted over time. Um, and it's a log scale. So basically what you're seeing is the number of drugs per billion dollars goes down is that drug discovery is getting exponentially more expensive. And there's a ton of reasons for that we could talk about, um, but basically it sort of, you know, universally follows this line. In computational sciences, we have this thing called Moore's Law, where computers get, you know, exponentially faster or better over time, basically. And we're always concerned about falling off that curve. And so this is kind of an inverse Moore's law that drug discovery gets exponentially worse over time. Ideally, you might you want to use the exponential improvement of computation to help offset that somehow. And so that's kind of what my lab is about. Particularly, we imagine a scenario where um, computation can really guide this drug discovery. And so we think a lot about this, this particular problem of maybe you're a chemist working in a drug discovery company um, or you're working with a chemist in a drug discovery company. And so there's a specific part of the problem which is called lead optimization where you have a small molecule like this, like this green one here, um, binding to this larger blobby protein. And um, you already have something that binds to your protein that you, or target of interest. So it's something that could become a drug but it doesn't bind strongly enough or it binds strongly enough, but has other problems that prevent it becoming a drug. So you need to change things about it, maybe improve binding or maintain binding while changing other properties to get it to where it actually could be useful as a drug. And so in that particular context, that context that's, that's lead optimization. Imagine you or your team generates ideas for a hundred new derivatives of that compound. So compounds that haven't made, been made before that somebody could make next to test. So you generate those ideas, 100 new ideas, plug them into the computer, and then you leave work for the day. And then overnight, the computer um, runs some calculations and figures out 
which of those will be the best. And that could be best in terms of how well they'll bind to their target, how well they will bind, avoid binding to other proteins in the body that it would cause problems if you hit, or maybe how likely uh, drug resistance mutations would be for those if you're um, talking about an antibacterial target. Or maybe even how soluble the compounds will be. Uh, typically, a drug needs to be soluble, so you can take it as a pill. You'd rather drugs that are requiring injections are much less. You really don't, most people don't don't use those unless they really really need them. Right? And maybe you'd even predict solvent conditions to purify it, or other compounds that hadn't been in the ideas list that they should consider. So then the, this person you know, plugs those into the computer, gets all these predictions back, and in the morning, the computer basically has sort of a rank list of things for them to consider. So then they pick you know, the best compound or two from the list, and they get to work making those to test. And so each synthesis of a new compound could take days to weeks. So if you do something like this, you're compressing like years worth of experimentation into run the calculations overnight and then just confirm the results. So that could really accelerate the process of drug discovery. So we work on tools to help with um, most of those or with a variety of those problems. We work on trying to make this vision reality. Um, and so one thing that we you know, have thought about in that problem is how accurate different methods need to be to how accurate predictions of binding need to be to be really helpful. And um, I won't talk too much about this plot. I could go into it more if anybody's interested. But the basic takeaway is that um, if you have a method that can predict correct binding free energies to a level of three kcal per mole accuracy, uh, I'm sorry, two kcal per mole accuracy, you can decrease the number of compounds somebody would have to synthesize by about a factor of three. And if you can make it a lot more accurate, so it has half a kcal per mole of, of error, then you decrease the number of compounds somebody needs to make by a factor of eight. And so those are, in either case, pretty significant gains, uh, especially if each, each, making each new compound takes a couple of weeks. So we're trying to get somewhere in that range, um, accuracy of you know, half a kcal per mole or two kcal per mole, so better than two kcal per mole. Now, what we're interested in predicting is this delta G, which is a binding free energy. And it's a ratio of these Q things, which are partition functions. They involve basically integrals over the relevant configurations of the sy different systems involved. The protein ligand complex on the left, the protein in the middle, and the ligand in solution. So all of these take place in solution. And so as a tool for doing this, we use molecular dynamics simulations, simulations of these different environments. And we're able to get the ratio of these partition functions out of those simulations in order to compute the binding free energy. So molecular dynamics simulations start with a description of the forces between all the atoms in a system. Um, basically, and then they basically integrate Newton's equations of motion to solve for what happens in a system as a function of time. This is a movie of, um, a drug binding to a kinase. It's not my movie, it's from D.E. Shaw. But it starts off in solution and then kind of finds a spot where it wants to, it, where it's interested in being some of the time on the surface and then wanders around a bit more and then eventually finds this real binding site where it, it prefers to be. So I like the, the movie of it binding, but I also like watching in this movie what the rest of the protein, this gray thing, is doing because it actually moves quite a lot. And so that's a neat thing that our, our, our simulations give us a window into is how dynamic these molecules are in solution, which is not something that's easy, that easy to see experimentally. So you can make nice movies with the simulations, but we also use them to calculate binding free energies or binding affinities, which are the, one of the quantities we're especially interested in. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about something called relative binding free energy calculations. So here we have a gray protein, uh, sort of this bigger shape, and then we have a ball-like ligand that's marked L1. And a relative binding free energy calculation compares two ligands, ligand 1 and ligand 2, that might differ by a functional group, uh, addition of some atoms. And um, 
So in this, it's called the thermodynamic cycle that I'm showing here, we change ligand one into ligand two in solution using calculations. And we change ligand two into ligand one in the binding site using calculations. And from the difference in those two, we can get the free energies for doing that, delta delta G solve and delta delta G site. And then we can calculate the difference in binding free energies from taking the difference in those two free energies. What that does for us is it allows us to say which of these ligands is going to be better at binding with this protein and by how much. And so if ligand one is one that we've already made and ligand two is a new ligand we're thinking about it, this tells us how much better or worse ligand two will be. We did quite a work, bit of work in my group previously to help automate these calculations. And so this is showing how well the predictions from this approach worked on a bunch of different protein targets. So different um, molecular machines that you would want molecules to bind to. So what you're looking for it here is the experiment is on the horizontal axis, the calculated value is on the vertical axis, and you'd like those two things to agree. So the closer the black dots, each dot is a prediction, the closer the black dots are to those blue, blue, horizontal, blue diagonal lines, the better it's working. And you'd like to see them yeah, be tightly clustered around that. So basically what you see here is that the methods are not great. Things are not really tightly clustered around the blue line. On the other hand, they, the dots do kind of track with the blue line. There's a correlation. And so basically what, what this, the data in this paper showed, um, this is a few years ago, but this was better, ac better performance than people in the pharmaceutical industry had been able to get out of any kind of computational method before. So this type of data helps the pharmaceutical industry get, interest, get excited about using these types of calculations in early stage drug discovery. And so they're now becoming a pretty routine tool that people use. But obviously, there's still a lot of room for improvement. The, those black dots are not that close to that blue line. Uh, I'm going to skip over this. Um, so one thing we have also done is absolute binding free energy calculations. Those look at binding of a single ligand, that this pink thing here, a single molecule, to a protein, which here is in yellow. And we get the free energy for doing that. So rather than comparing related ligands, we just look at how well an individual ligand will bind. And we can do those by some tricks, particularly we um, use a thermodynamic cycle where we first restrain the ligand to a reference orientation in the binding site. Then we compute the free energy of turning off the interactions in the binding site. And, and so that's the really important part down at that bottom right. Now we have a ligand that's something like a stealth ligand. It can't feel the protein anymore, and the protein can't feel it. This is a trick we can do in a computer. And so then that's the same as having our non-interacting ligand. Um, by itself and the protein with no ligand there. So if the protein had changed its shape to accommodate the ligand, as often it does, we can capture the effect as it now changes back. Then we remove the restraints and we compute the free energy of turning off back on the ligand's interactions in water. And so if we've done this right, what we've done now is move the ligand from being bound to the protein at the top right to in solution towards the top left. And if we add up the free energies of those black arrows going around there, they add up to the negative of delta G zero, where delta G zero is the thing we're interested in. So that allows us to calculate a binding free energy. And so what we can do for that is we use some fast methods called docking to generate possible placements of our ligands into the binding site. Then we start running simulations and we try to predict how well the ligand binds from that. We've done this now in a series of different model binding sites, and then nowadays we work on um, binding sites that are biologically relevant. These model binding sites, though, I'll talk about them a bit because they have taught us a lot about how to get the calculations to work well and their limitations. Um, and these are predictions we made, blind predictions where we didn't know the answer in a couple of these different binding sites. And again, there's room for improvement, but we also see results that sort of generally track around this, this line where we're doing a good job predicting things. Um, and I'll, I'll skip over this, but this is a biologically relevant system for drug discovery that, that we were able to predict quite a bit about which ligands bind. 
Another interesting thing you can do with these same calculations is predict um, what's called selectivity. So if I want to make a good drug for treating something in particular, often there'll be other related proteins in the body that I would like to avoid because if I'm after just dealing with this one issue, I don't want to, my molecule to interact with other related proteins that are going to go off and cause side effects. So this tree-like thing in the middle here is showing a diagram of a whole protein family of proteins containing what's called a bromodomain. And so this ligand on the left is something that binds to a number of these, and we're interested in predicting which ones it binds to so we can understand how, how much it will be specific for one, one of them over all the rest. And so it turns out that you can actually use these same calculations I've been talking about to compare binding of a single ligand to multiple proteins, multiple members of this family. And that now it's these dots over on the right. It's the same type of plot. But then now instead of looking at many ligands binding to one protein, we're looking at many proteins binding to one ligand. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about more about what we've learned from about the challenges with these calculations. One of them is that, so this pink here is a, a ligand, a molecule binding to this protein. So the pink is the structure with the ligand bound, and the green is the structure of the protein without the ligand bound. So the, the pink thing in the middle is the ligand, and then the pink thing up to the left of that is part of the protein that moves when the ligand binds. And uh, what we find down at the bottom there is that depending on which structure we use for starting our simulations, the pink or the green, we get two different answers. And if our simulations are long enough, this shouldn't happen. We should get the same answer regardless of what protein structure we started with. So uh, once we know there's a problem there, and the problem is that this, this um, side chain, the pink and green up to the left of that ligand, it isn't rearranging on ligand binding. Uh, even though it should. So once we know that's a problem, we can deliberately sort of force it to rearrange and then include the free energy for doing that. And when we do that, then we get the same answers regardless of which structure we, we started from, which is good. Um, but there are other types of motions that happen in proteins that we also don't always capture. Particularly in this same protein, as we have larger and larger ligands bind, there's a part of the protein circled in yellow that moves, and you can, you can kind of see some of the different structures of it there. The ligands are the sort of wire-looking things just below and to the left of that. Um, and so we wanted to look at this and, and see how big of a challenge it is for our calculations to capture it. So what happens here is as you start from these ring-like ligands on the lower left, and then you lengthen their tail as you move along that arrow, um, you, the protein moves from a closed structure to an intermediate structure to an open structure. And those are the purple and the sort of cyan and then the green on the right. And so the protein moves more and more as we make the ligand bigger. Basically, the protein has to make more room for it. And this has been studied experimentally. And they find basically that the protein exists in three uh, shapes, a closed shape in purple, an intermediate state in blue, and an open state in green. And as the ligands bind, the sort of general trend is the bigger ligands, which are further down this list, bind better. Better means more; these numbers are more negative. Um, but also, as they bind better, the protein has to rearrange more. The ones with Na, that means that value wasn't able to be measured experimentally for reasons I could explain later. Uh, so as you go to bigger ligands, you see the protein rearrange more, but also you mostly see binding be a bit, being a bit better. So we use these relative free energy calculations. We wanted to look at how well we can capture these protein motions in our calculations. So um, as we, uh, yeah, so let's, let's let's take a look at this in a little more detail. So we're going to look at, um, Particularly, we're going to look at cases where we take a ligand and a ligand that would bind to the closed structure, the purple structure, and we're going to change it or replace it with a ligand that binds to the open structure in green. And we're going to see if our simulations capture that motion. If they do, that's great. 
If they don't, that means there's going to be some error in our calculations. So what we're looking for is whether we get the same answer in our calculations, whether we start with the closed structure or the open structure. If we get the same answer regardless of what structure we start from, that means the calculations are working well. If we don't get the same answer regardless, then there's a problem. It's a, it basically means our simulations aren't long enough to capture the important motion in the protein. So to check that, we're going to look at the difference in the answer we get starting from the closed structure and the answer we get starting from the open structure. So just to, um, just to help you follow this, we're going to be looking at this red column. But the red column, let's look at the first row that has benzene and, and hexylbenzene. Um, the, the thing in the closed column tells me the answer I got starting from when I started my calculations in the closed structure. And the one in the green column tells me the answer I got when I started from the open structure. So one is 4.1, the other is negative 0.6. And those should be the same answer, but they're not. And so if I take the difference between those two, that's a measure of how wrong my answers are. Um, and the difference is 4.7 kcals per mole. And so that's why it's in red. My difference, my difference should be zero, but it's not. So it's telling us we're not capturing this protein motion. Particularly, um, so there this is again, uh, we're getting this error of 4.7 in the red. Let's look at what happens. Um, on the top right, we're looking at a plot of um, which structure it's in as a function of time in the simulation. And it's purple if it's in the closed structure. What we've done here is we've replaced the small ligand with the big ligand. And so this top purple plot is showing uh, us that we should, our protein should have moved to the green structure because we put the green big ligand, the big ligand in, but it didn't, it stayed in the purple structure. So it's stuck basically. It's sort of like a door that can't open. In the bottom plot, we're looking at what happens if we take the big ligand and we replace it with the small ligand. So we started with the green structure, and we're trying to see if it goes back to the purple structure. And the same thing happens. We're stuck in the green structure, even though we should be going to the purple structure. And so that's what gives this big red number on the left, 4.7 kcals per mole, is that the protein is stuck. So what do we do? Well, we can just run the simulations a lot longer. And if we do that, we start seeing that now, in these plots on the right, we're seeing some switches between the purple and the green structure. And that's good. It means we're starting to capture the important protein motion. And so that brings our error on the left down to 0.7 kcals per mole. So it's still not down to zero, but it's a lot closer. And that's good. So overall, after we do that, we run our simulations a lot longer. And we use a couple other tricks to speed up this sampling of protein motion. We can do an OK job capturing um, the experimental trends. Certainly a lot better than we did to begin with. OK, I'm happy to take a couple questions there if anybody has wants me to explain any of these ideas really quickly before I go on to some more related things. Um, yeah, David, I have. Two questions. One is at the very beginning when you started, and one is related to what you were talking now. One is, uh, maybe I missed it, but w what's the source of the increase, uh, the exponential increase in cost for the oh, yeah. drugs over time? What, what is driving sure. that? Yeah, I don't, we don't totally know. It's probably not any one factor, but there's a whole bunch of things. So one has been that, so it's the FDA that sort of regulates this drug discovery process. And so one factor is that, you know, the amount of data people need to get new drugs, discover, to, to get new drugs approved gets higher, larger and larger. Um, one specific example is that, you know, if you printed the data associated with um, a recent drug approval, if you print it out and you stacked all the sheets of, the, of paper up, the stack would be taller than the Empire State Building. So that's a lot of paperwork that has to go into a drug group, drug approval, trials and all kinds of things. And there's good reasons for that. If you don't do good trials, maybe your drug is going to do nothing good. Maybe it's going to kill people. That's one reason. 
Another reason is that um, a problem that's been called the better than the Beatles problem. I don't know if you're a fan of the, the music group, the Beatles, but um, imagine that uh, you like the Beatles and you were happy listening to their music and their music was available for free to anyone to listen to as much as they wanted. Um, and if everybody liked the Beatles, you know, what would another music group have to do to be successful? Well, you can't compete with the Beatles on price because their music is available for free. So you actually have to be better than the Beatles before anybody will buy your music. And that seems a little bit absurd when it comes to music because people get bored with it. But if you think about translating that to a pharmaceutical drug, nobody wants to switch to a new drug because they're bored with their old drug. They switch to a new one because it's better. And basically, once things be drugs become generic, they're available basically for free or you know for a couple of bucks or whatever. So that is a problem that faces drug discovery. If you're dealing with a disease that already has decent drugs for it, uh, you, new drugs have to be better than the old ones. Some diseases don't don't have decent drugs for them. But then we come to the problem called the low hanging fruit problem. Maybe all the easy diseases already have drugs for them. And all we're left with is hard diseases, where it's really hard to develop a new drug. So, you know, maybe it was gonna be cheap developing drugs for some of the old diseases, but the ones we still are dealing with, drug discovery for those is a lot harder. So those are just some of the factors that go into driving the increase in cost. Okay, that's pretty, pretty interesting. And then the question that was specific to where you were discussing is, you were mentioning that if the simulation doesn't arrive at the right answer when you start with two different configurations that you need longer simulations because you would expect that you would reach the thermodynamic solution. But isn't it that highlighting maybe that that ligand with that protein might be intrinsically having metastable states that will also be reflected in the, in, in the experimental or in the real system? Yeah, so um, those are good questions. Yes, these are systems that have a bunch of metastable states. And yes, sometimes the experiment, you can access those same states experimentally. Um, as far as weighting the various metastable states for which you'd need a lot of time if you're doing it by molecular dynamics, why don't yep. you do it by Monte Carlo? Yeah, actually, that's sort of the next part of my talk. Oh. Um, so yeah, it's it can be hard with Monte Carlo too. But yeah, so basically, you know, the experiment is typically driven by, the experimental binding for energy is typically driven by one or a few, one or a couple dominant states that contribute more than all or most all of the others. And because of the time scales that we're able to simulate, uh, if we're not careful, we might not find those states. And so then we end up getting a wrong answer, even though we might be seeing another metastable state that, you know, is there, is present there some t to some small fraction experimentally. It's just not the dominant state. I want to make a comment about the cost. The, it is true that it's very expensive, but it's also true that the profits are very big. And the yep. pharmaceutical companies are not losing money. They are making okay. huge profits. Some of them are. Yep. Yeah. The, um, I mean, essentially, we, just, we incentivize them to uh, make huge gambles, you know, make a $2 billion gamble by saying, okay, if you find something good, we'll grant you a temporary monopoly over that, you know, for six years or something like that. So you can sell it for whatever you can possibly justify or whatever you can charge for a few years. And then eventually it'll become a generic. And so then you're going to be selling it to us for three bucks. So yeah, we let them make a ton of money off of it as sort of a trade in order to get drug development to happen, drug discovery to happen. All right. So since this isn't a politics talk, um, let's keep going and talk about Monte Carlo a little bit. So one of the um, issues that we've dealt with is slow motion. And particularly one type of slow motion we can have is slow rearrangements between different ways a ligand can fit into a binding site. 
So on the left, we have a ligand where the methyl group it's called is pointing to the left. So on the right, it's pointing to the right. And these are different, the wire mesh is the binding site. What often happens in our simulations is if we place the ligand into the left binding mode, it stays stuck there. If we place it into the right binding mode, it stays stuck there, unless we simulate a really long time. And so then that makes it hard for us to get the right answer unless we know which way it's supposed to fit in. Or we can just sort of count both of them and there's a rigorous way to combine this at the, bro at the bottom. But, and that works fine if there's just a couple binding modes, but if there's a lot, it gets really expensive to do this. So we wanted something better, particularly if we have a bunch of different binding modes, a bunch of different ways a ligand could fit into a binding site, shown in the different colors here. What would be really nice would be if we could do some sort of a calculation on um, where we just simulate it, find out how much time it wants to spend in each binding mode. And each dot here represents like an amount of time. So what I'm showing is there's a lot of blue dots. So that's saying it, it wants to spend a lot of time in the blue binding mode. And there's few green dots that's saying it wants to spend a li only little time in the green binding mode. So if I could run some simulations where I um, could count that up, then I could calculate the correct binding free energy by using analyzing only one of these binding modes. So we wanted a way to do that. And this is a problem that does come up in reality. Here's a bunch of different ways that ibuprofen can bind to a key protein in your bloodstream, human serum albumin, a bunch of different places it can fit. Um, and here's another place, HIV integrase, which is a target for HIV, a drug target. This pink is a single ligand that can bind to this protein in eight or six different places. Uh, and I'm going to skip over that part. So to get to the Monte Carlo part, um, Sam Gill in my group was sort of the mastermind of this method we call BLUES, binding modes of ligands using enhanced sampling. And this is a kind of interesting Monte Carlo method, partially Monte Carlo method. So this um, focuses on uh, looking at how, or we're gonna start by talking about how ligands orient into a binding site. And so the blue is a binding site and the black is a ligand. And so this combines something called non-equilibrium candidate Monte Carlo with molecular dynamics. And since folk here know a bit about Monte Carlo, I'll say as, as a starting point and by way of motivation, what typically happens if we do Monte Carlo, just plain Monte Carlo on these systems, is that all the moves get rejected because they're too dense. We can make the moves really, really tiny so that some of them would get accepted, but that tends to be so, so tiny as to be practically useless. If we propose any kind of significant moves, well, we've got a densely packed protein system packed into dense solvent, and everything just ends up being too crowded. So nothing, none of the interesting or worthwhile moves ever get accepted at a significant rate. So this non-equilibrium candidate Monte Carlo thing, as I'll explain, is a method to make Monte Carlo moves in dense systems easier to accept. So um, back to our system, we have this blue protein and the black ligand. What we do is we propose a rant. We want, we're trying to rotate the ligand in the binding site. So what we do is we scale back the interactions between the ligand and the protein. Then we pick it up and we reorient it randomly in the binding site. And then we scale back on the interactions kind of gradually. And that allows the environment to relax a bit. Um, and that relaxation potentially can remove clashes that otherwise would have been there. And it can result in higher acceptance rates. However, you can't just relax the system and then say, oh, that makes for a good Monte Carlo move. You need your Monte Carlo moves to obey detailed balance and you know, be appropriate from a stat mech point of view. So the trick is that you, you run that whole process as a fancy type of Monte Carlo moves. So the process is you turn off the interactions between your ligand and your protein, you rotate it, you turn back on the interactions, and you monitor the non-equilibrium work done in that process, that non-equilibrium process. And then you accept or reject the move based on the non-equilibrium work done in the whole process. 
And so that's this non-equilibrium candidate Monte Carlo. You're proposing a non-equilibrium, you're doing a non-equilibrium process, and then you accept or reject the move on the basis of the work done. And so that does still preserve the correct thermodynamics. And it allows you to get, um, oh, my movie is slightly broken, but um, it allows you to get better acceptance of moves in these dense systems than you otherwise would get. So what you should have seen in this movie is that the ligand becomes transparent and then flips around and then turns back on. But um, let's keep going because you'll get the idea in a minute. So we've tested this first on one of the model binding sites we know well um, because we know what should happen, we know what the right answer is. Particularly we know, so this is toluene binding to T4 lysozyme. There's these two orange binding modes at the top that are really the same thing except for if you color one of the atoms red, that you can make these two binding modes distinguishable. And that should spend about 40% of the time in that orange binding mode, and then about 60% of time in the purple one, um, which also is, has two versions. And it should take about 100 nanoseconds to flip between the, the two purple ones and about 100 nanoseconds to flip between the two orange ones, but flipping across is easier. Uh, so 100 nanoseconds is a long time for us. We'd rather not simulate that long. So this can be slow. So um, with enough simulation time, we should see this um, ligand move between all of these binding modes. So I'm just going to show you data from a normal vanilla molecular dynamics simulation and is color coded based on which binding mode it's in. This is a, a, an angle that allows you to tell which binding mode it's in. So basically what you see is it spends most of the simulation going back and forth between the top two binding modes and then only flips after about 100 nanoseconds. What you'd like to see is that it goes back and forth between all of them quickly. So when we combine this instead with our new um, non-equilibrium candidate Monte Carlo method, we get this instead. So we get rapid transitions between the different binding modes. Um, and that's good because if we didn't know how much time it should spend in each binding node, now we could count how much time it would spend in each and figure out the right answer. Particularly, you can turn those plots on the left into histograms on the right and figure out how much time it spends in each one. And in the vanilla one on the top, you see that we're undercounting the blue and the red by a lot. Um, and in the blues one on the bottom, you can see that we're getting the populations close to correct much more quickly. Um, and you can make a statistical model of how much simulation time that saves you, and I won't go into that. Um, then also with Megan, who actually is in this program now and is, I think, in this seminar, um, we looked some at uh, actually biological re biologically relevant target called soluble epoxide hydrolase and compared um, prediction, blues prediction of binding modes for a bunch of fragments with method, with predictions from other methods. Um, we basically know that in this binding site, there's sort of two main regions for binding. Um, so we expect to be able to find binding modes kind of scattered across these two regions. And so here's a quick movie showing on the left, a normal molecular dynamic simulation of our ligand in one of these binding sites, and on the right, a blue simulation in the right-hand one will change color every time it flips binding mode. So you can see it flips a few times here. Um, and we could take that type of data and do some clustering on it, project it onto um, like a sort of free energy map to get a sense of how it switches between binding modes. When we do that, that'll allow us to count how much time it spends in each binding mode, which is part of what we're after. So we can make these sorts of plots of the probability of it being in each binding mode. And we can eventually turn that into predictions. And this is just showing um, how good we are at predicting binding modes of a number of different ligands um, compared to other methods. So the plot on the left shows RMSD, which is like a measure of distance or error. So higher is worse. And it's showing this for three different methods. Docking, which is one established method in this area, in the pink and the red. Uh, normal molecular dynamics in the green, the shades of green. 
and blue is in the shades of blue. And um, the sort of hour, so in the left plot, each group of three bars is a different ligand. And the right plot combines the results across a bunch of different ligands. So what you can basically see is that um, docking doesn't do very well. Again, higher is worse, looking at that right plot. And MD does a bit better, and then blues does better still. Um, but more importantly, and more compelling than those bars, if you ask in the data that we generated, how often do you find the correct binding mode in one of the ones that your method says should be highly populated? So particularly of the top two most populated binding modes, um, how often are they right, meaning within like two angstroms of the experimental structure, the crystal structure? So docking, that's only two out of the 29 cases we looked at. MD, it's 12 out of 29, and blues, it's 25 out of 29. So blues is doing much better at finding the right binding modes. Um, so that was great, it was encouraging, but that's our random ligand rotations that I talked about. We also, but, and that works well for basically rigid bodies. So if a ligand is like a small rigid thing, we can randomly rotate it. Um, and here's this, the binding, the wiring mesh here is the binding site for these small ligands we might be able to randomly rotate. It. But as we go to bigger ligands like this pink one, there's no way you can pick up that whole ligand within the blue wire mesh and randomly rotate it so that it stays within the blue wire mesh or very little way. Most of the time it's gonna be sticking off and overlapping with the protein. So when we get to larger flexible ligands like this pink one, we need a better approach. Um, at the same time, we already have information about how a ligand might fit that we can easily generate from methods like docking. Here's some information from docking on different ways this ligand might fit into the binding site, and it's pretty good at coming up with reasonable ideas. So maybe we could use that information to help improve blues. Um, so Sam Gill and the group has been working on, um, let me just jump to here, a method to use that type of data to make this approach more efficient. So each of these solid, solid colored ligands here is a different binding mode that we already know about. And we come up with a way to try to hop the ligand between these different predefined binding modes in a simulation. So that when it gets near one of them, it can propose hopping to another one. And so here's a simulation of the ligand in the binding site where it does that. And so we're able to get these moves to work some of the time. Um, so that's promising, but there's still a lot more that needs to be done on it. Um, but we can also use the same technique to attack some slightly different problems. Earlier I mentioned this one where there's a side chain in the protein here, this pink slash green on the, on the upper left, that needs to rearrange when a ligand binds. And we have to run kind of long simulations or use other tricks to capture that. But we can also go back to it with blues and just use blues to rearrange that side chain. And, or accelerate transitions of the side chain to predict which way it wants to point. So here we're looking at how many transitions we get per amount of simulation time. Uh, and the blue, so more is better. And the blue bars are with blues, the orange bar is with normal MD. So basically, we get way more transitions now per amount of simulation time, so we can predict which way the, that side chain wants to point much more rapidly. We can also use the same thing for rotation of internal bonds in ligands, like the one this pink arrow points to. The top graph is showing which way that orients in a normal MD simulation, and you want to see lots of jumps. You don't see any. The other graphs, the bottom three, are showing blue simulations where you see jumps in that dihedral angle as we get transitions. Um, and so then if we ask, okay, well, what does that mean for the things we can calculate with it? Well, if we run normal molecular dynamics on the left and we calculate how much time it wants to point each way, um, for a case where, the, the, where we should get 50%, on the left, normal MD does not get us to 50%. And on the right, with blues, if we run 10 times shorter, we do get 50% pretty quickly. We can also use this for more interesting cases where it shouldn't be 
This is a um, drug target where we're able to predict rotation of this bond in the ligand and we get the right answer should be about um, 60, 40, and we get very close to that pretty quickly. So I told you that we can predict binding free energies with some amount of accuracy. Uh, but sometimes we have problems with slow sampling of different metastable states, different binding modes or different protein motions. And so that can, that can cause problems sometimes. Um, so we have this Monte combined Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics method that can help accelerate sampling of different binding modes. And um, we are you know, working with different people on applying some of these techniques to experimental drug discovery problems. So happy to take more questions now. And uh, thanks for your attention and your time. Thank you. Well, Jose, I don't know. Well, thank you, uh, David. Um, anyone has any questions? Just to have a comment that uh, uh, just forgot to say that David is a faculty in the Computational Science Joint Program with UCI. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I should have showed this because it's the most important slide. Um, so there's my research group, uh, which probably a few people have moved on already, but that's a good photo still. And lots of acknowledgments for people who've done a lot of this work. Um, if you might be willing to go back to the one before the this before this one. You mean the conclusions, or are you talking about project? Uh, the four, uh, yeah, this one. Um, most of those, or at least a lot of those points, seem to be like right at your two kcal limit yep. off the line. Mm -hmm. um, those are the ones you've been telling us about. How you go in further and try to figure out why, or. They just yeah, we spent a lot of effort in trying to figure out why for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, <laughs> just the comment. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So I mean, in, in the sort of basic upshot is right now, state of the art is that um, in favorable cases for like favorable drug discovery type projects, people can get like one to maybe 1.5 kcal for more accuracy with these types of calculations. And in unfavorable ones, it's much worse. What tends to happen in the pharmaceutical industry then is for a particular target, they'll do some sort of exploratory calculations to figure out whether the technique is gonna work well or not. If it works fairly well, it will tend to keep working fairly well on that target, and so they can use it for their whole project, which might run for you know, years, year, a year or years. And if it doesn't work well, then they don't use it on that target. So it's sort of a project de dis dependent decision. Some projects it'll work well enough they use it, other projects they don't. And so a lot of the sign the you know what needs to be done in here both is you know improve accuracy on the projects where it does work, but then figure out how do you get it to work on the other projects. Sorry, maybe I missed it, but is the whole protein moving in blues or are you just uh, moving a, a small section close to the ligand? Right, yes, the answer is yes um, to both of those. So uh, in the MD part, the whole protein moves. But then when you're doing the non-Ethereum candidate Monte Carlo part, um, the, we only let a small portion close to the ligand move. And the reason for that is because if you let the whole thing move, you get a lot more sort of dissipative work going on and it gets a lot harder to accept the moves you know, sort of like friction and stuff distant from the, pro from the binding site. So we find that in practice, we get better acceptance if we keep the distant parts of the protein rigid than if we let them move. Even though you might worry that in some cases, the distant rearrangements might be important. Sure, and maybe could you comment a little bit about what you do to increase the probability of accepting a Monte Carlo move? Is that essentially just accepting unfavorable moves um, to, to a certain extent? No, I mean, so, well, you know, we're using like the normal Metropolis criteria, and so unfavorable moves are accepted with the, the normal, you know, e to the minus beta, delta, in this case, non-equilibrium work. So 
it's very unlikely to accept unfavorable moves. But the improved acceptance relative to normal Monte Carlo comes from basically just the protocol we follow. So you turn off the ligands interactions with the protein uh, gradually. You monitor the work done in that. You move the ligand and you turn them back on gradually. And so as you turn it off and you turn it on, that allows the environment to relax a little bit. So let's suppose you, you know, you if you'd done an instantaneous move, you would have proposed placing the ligand into a place where it would have clashed with the protein or it would have clashed with the water molecule. Only a small clash, but a clash that was terrible anyway. Where a small motion of your ligand might have removed that clash. Okay. So a normal Monte Carlo move would reject that. This process of proposing moving it over there, but then turning it back on gradually allows it to move like a little bit away so that it alleviates the clash and now you found someplace good. So it's in a way it's almost like making a bigger cross section for your target. You know, sure. Before with a normal Monte Carlo move, you have to hit the good spot exactly. And with right. this, you can come near it and then relax your way into it. Sure, I guess the issue there is that maybe in theory you're increasing your temperature a little bit, right? How do you kind of manage your temperature parity between your MD and your, and your Monte Carlo? So we're, it's, it, it's something that's derived from non-equilibrium statmec. So basically we don't have a temperature for the Monte Carlo that's anything other than the temperature we use for our MD. So we're just, yeah, the temperature is basically dictated by this, the temperature we're running the MD at. Okay. I don't know if there might be clever things one could do where you could somehow mismatch those and deliberately and then you know do some sort of reweighting trick to get things back into balance. As far as I know, that's, that science hasn't been developed yet. So we didn't invent the NCMC method. It's from um, Niemeyer, Cooksman, and Kadera about 2011, about where the we our innovation here is applying it to these types of problems. Yeah, no, I'm I'm very aware of John's work. Um, I, I wonder, so the, the moves that you're using, are they in dihedral or uh, Cartesian space? I guess that's my last question. <laughs> yeah, so we have actually a variety of different types of moves. Okay. Um, so we have dihedral moves. Um, we have, so the rigid body rotation moves are essentially in something kind of like Euler angle space. Yeah. Um, we have dihedral moves. We actually also have water hopping moves that I didn't talk about where you might take a water molecule and propose rearranging it for other reasons. And those are Cartesian space moves. We also, yeah, the, the molecular darting stuff I talked about at the end is uh, Z matrix moves, moves with, in, so internal coordinate moves with um, Cartesian moves on top of them. Okay, thank you. I had a question about the, um, uh, the conformational changes to the ligand uh, that you mentioned towards the end. Uh, I've got a, a colleague, Jeff Gustafson, who studies um, atrip isomers, so often drug candidates. Oh, cool. Where, so, you, right, hindered rotation. Yeah, those are awesome molecules. Right, and, uh, and often um, non-equivalent minima, right? So, yeah. Um, so in this, I, I hadn't, he's looking at these as kind of single molecule systems and, you know, and, until you were showing us this, I wasn't thinking about the influence of the environment, the protein environment on these relative energies. So is, mm -hmm. if, if those shift around because of the interaction with the protein, is, is that taken into account explicitly in these calculations? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and if, he's, if he's looking at those in the gas phase, even, even going to solvent can shift the relative minima. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's there. And yeah, going to a protein can shift it further. Okay. I actually had, a, the student who was working on this was actually looking for atrop isomers to validate some of it on. Um, so we played around with that a little bit, but I don't think we found good uh, data to compare against. But those are some, of, I only learned about that in the last couple of years, and that's some of the coolest, like, quote, stereochemistry ever. Okay, could I put him in touch with you just in case? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah that's, thanks that's very good. much. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating work. Yeah, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, atrop isomers are just so cool. They're non chiral stereo, you know, molecules that have stereochemistry. So if you think about like biphenyl or something where you have like two different rings that uh, you know, join in the middle by rotatable bond, 
if you put bulky substituents on either side of the rotatable bond, then you can't get them to rotate anymore. And so it effectively becomes chiral, even though it's not chiral. And you can separate the, you know, enantiomers or whatever experimentally. I have one more question, David. Um, so what is the degree of conformational change in, for example, in Armstrong's that would cause that difference of two kilocal per mole that you have targeted as a resolution? What, what is that uncertainty on the, on the, on the conformation? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think anyone knows the general answer to that yet. Um, I mean, I think it's sort of weird. I think when I started working in this area, people thought that like only big protein conformational changes could cause an error of a couple of kcals per mole. Um, but then like, you know, what I found is that even like a single side chain rearrangement, which people often, like it's a non-polar side chain, which people often think is not that big a deal, that can cause an error of three or four kcals per mole. So, but you know, in other cases, a single side chain rearrangement does nothing. So I'm not sure there's a general answer to it. I think it's that, you know, sometimes very tiny changes can be really important and sometimes it takes a big change to be important and I think it depends on the system. But I mean, so as presumably a, one could collect some sort of statistics about that on a lot of systems and say something on average, but nobody's done that yet to my knowledge. So as a follow up on, on this then, um, do you think that, for example, the force fields, and, and in your case, you make comparisons with crystals, when you have the proteins on the crystal configuration, you, you have internal tensions that you would not necessarily have when you have them in, in, in dissolve. So yeah. ha have you thought or, or that maybe some of these limiting factors come from the fact that some of the force fields and even our own comparisons with the experiments might be biased because of the crystals? Yeah, those are really interesting questions. We're working a little bit on some of those issues. Um, there's kind of actually two different things that end up interfacing with what you just asked. One is the crystal environment. And that can be a little bit harder to assess, but uh, we do some simulations of protein crystals and look at how at ligands binding in the crystals and compare it to experiment. So you know, usually here we're simulating a single ligand in a single protein, but you can also take the whole thing and simulate it in its crystalline environment and look at how that is that's different. So you have a collaboration with them, some experimental groups looking at that. The other thing that's different that you didn't mention is the temperature. Particularly a lot of the crystal structures we use are from liquid nitrogen temperatures. You crystallize the room temperature, of course, but then you flash cool it in liquid nitrogen and you shoot it with x-rays afterwards. And so it's at liquid nitrogen temperature. But it turns out now with some of the new x-ray sources um, and some of the new data collection technology, you can actually do room temperature or at least nearly room temperature crystallography. And we're doing a study right, finishing a study right now on one of the, the lysozyme system that I talked about that looks at how side chain orientations are different in experimental room temperature crystals. And it actually turns out that the, the simulations in the force fields agree better with the room temperature experiment than with the cryo experiment. The cryo will often freeze the side chains, not, maybe often is not the right word, will sometimes freeze the side chains in the wrong position. And by sometimes, what I really mean is that some fraction of the side chains get frozen into the wrong position. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? There is no well, more are we going to uh, have the virtual toast at this point? Sure. Okay. <laughs> we usually, David, we usually take the speaker to for a beer after nice. the talk, but uh, now we owe that to you. So, okay. Well, I'll eventually, my water when bottle. you when you come uh, when you come to campus, then we will take you. Cool. To take a rain check now. Thanks. 
You'll have to live vicariously through me and my Christmas lights. Okay. Nice. Anyway. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for uh, coming and thank you, David, for a great talk. Thank you, David.